WWE have produced a lot of wrestling matches in their time, and they'd very much like to sit you down and make sure you watch each and every one of them clockwork orange style. More wrestling. More. Get it in your eyeballs. After all, that is why they made their own streaming service, stuffed to the brim with their own back catalogue. Although you could argue that WWE's current performance on Peacock might mean they don't actually want you to watch any of their matches live anymore. WWE are their own biggest fans, of course, especially when it comes to their history. Documentaries, playlists, top tens, all about their favourite classic wrestling wrestling moment. However, there are some wrestling matches from WWE's past that don't quite gel with how WWE would like to be presented today. Matches that the biased historian that is WWE would very much prefer none of us ever saw again. I'm Adam Hailing from Parts Fun Known, and here are the 10 matches WWE don't want you to see. But we obviously want you to see all of our videos, and the best way to make sure you see all of our videos is to like and subscribe to Parts Fun Known. Just click that button. Click it. Don't please click the button though. Number 10, Roddy Piper versus Bad News Brown. Ah yes, the blackface match. WWE has actually dabbled in blackface a number of times, and now that I've said I really think dabbled is absolutely the wrong word, but sod it, they did it, not me. There's the infamous DX segment where they came out dressed as the nation of domination and like, way to prove the nation right about how sh race relations were in WWE back in the 90s, doing their job for them there. There's a jaw-droppingly awful match between Goldust and Flash Funk where Goldie does blackface. Oh Jesus Christ, it's a huge car crash. And then there's this blackface on the grandest stage of the all. A match notorious for getting WWE in trouble with Peacock on day one of their partnership, where Rowdy Roddy Piper used blackface as, I guess, mind games for his match against Bad News Brown at WrestleMania 6, daubing half his face and body in black body paint. WWE are so committed to you not seeing this throwback that it's been cut from the Mania 6 broadcast on both Peacock and the WWE Network. Jesus wept. Number 9, Deborah versus Sable. Today, WWE cares about women's wrestling, a fact that might have passed you by if you saw that god awful belt swap segment on Smackdown, but apparently they do. And hell, despite my sarcasm, which I cannot turn off by the way, so just imagine what it's like to be me every day, WWE books its women's championships like big deals. WrestleMania 37, the main event of WrestleMania 35, by and large, the belts mean something, which is why WWE would probably like you to forget about all the ways it pissed on the women's championship back in the Attitude Era. First off, Harvey Whippleman won the thing, Fabulous Moolah won it in her 70s in a ludicrous match, and then there's this, an evening gown match on Raw for the belt, where Sable won the match by stripping Deborah down to her bra and panties, but then commissioner and horn dog Shawn Michaels said that actually Deborah won the match and the belt because she got naked first. Perhaps a single worst title change in all of WWE history, and maybe the biggest indictment to WWE's women's division of the time. Number eight, Trish Stratus and Bradshaw versus Jackie Gator and Chris Nowinski. Oh, 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 goody. This match is a train wreck and a hell of a fly in the ointment of WWE's presentation of Trish Stratus as one of the greatest women's wrestlers of all time. Jackie Gator was fresh off tough enough and nowhere near ready to be on live television having wrestling matches, which actually, looking back, makes this whole thing seem actually really quite dangerous. Dangerous. Trish was still two years away from making WWE branded history by main eventing Raw with Lita, and oh, this match is just the drizzling sh**. Stratus and Gator missed time so many moves they might as well have been in different time zones. The finish involves something that was supposed to be a top rope bulldog but end up being a top rope very light pat on the head. It takes a certain amount of wrestling crapulence for one of the commentators to say mercifully it's over when the bell rings and that goes double when that commentator is Jim Ross, one of the industry's biggest pros, well back then anyway. Easily one of the most commonly named worst matches in WWE history. That's not even taking into account the fact this match also features Chris Nowinski, a man who causes WWE no end of PR nightmares by being one of the biggest public figures to draw links between wrestling and CTE in the years following his departure from the company. Number seven, The Undertaker versus The Big Boss Man. It's because it features a man being hanged live on TV. That's something the Victorians would look at and think, oh, that's a bit much, and they bloody loved murder. It's a match and moment infamous in all the wrong ways. It was the first famously terrible Hell in the Cell match, although there had actually been two sh** cell matches on Raw before this, which no one remembers. It's one of Grim Dark Grim Mark's top three worst matches of his whole stream and once more with feeling, after the match was over, they ran a segment which involved the big boss man being hanged and, I guess, killed? Live on TV with just bloody loads of children watching, some of whom in the crowd who no doubt had just a bunch of questions for their parents. What do you say to little Timmy when he asks you why Undertaker just murdered a man in front of you? I mean, uh, it certainly does appear that way, son, but uh, to look at it another way, off to bed? It's super grim and horrible, and evidently WWE agree, because even when they did include the match on the Undertaker's streak DVD, they cut the footage right after the bell. Number six, John Cena versus Kurt Angle. This one's a little sillier, but 
with the benefit of hindsight, you can absolutely bet that WWE would have liked to have never booked this match. See, a cornerstone of Big Match John's Big Match character is that he never gives up. And you know he doesn't because he wrote it on a little towel. You can't write lies on a little towel. It's against Hitchhiker's Law. True to his little towel words, Johnny C would back that up in the ring, not once ever tapping out in a wrestling match in what's almost been 20 years. For real, nearly two full decades. And the man has never tapped, which must really annoy WWE when you consider that John Cena has actually tapped out on camera not once, not twice, but thrice. And this match, Cena versus Angle, that was on pay-per-view at No Mercy. Look, look at John Cena tapping out. Look at him giving up. This isn't the only time Cena has tapped out, of course, also submitting to Chris Jericho on SmackDown in 2002 and Chris Benoit in 2003, but they will all be tucked away underneath a mountain of little towels, all of which forever tainted by Kurt Angle. And I don't like how I phrase that. Number five, Big Show versus Batista. Talk about a wholesale rejection of everything your company stands for. Now, it's no secret that WWE ECW didn't work. Hell, WWE said as much when Vince cancelled the show live on Raw. However, WWE would very much like to project the narrative that the reason reason ECW failed was because ECW itself was terrible. It's all the extremists' fault. Nothing to do with Vince McMahon do-rag champion or firing Paul Heyman or matches like Big Show versus Batista. Oh man, it's a pure schadenfreude train wreck. The August 1st, 2006 episode of ECW was filmed at the Hammerstein Ballroom, a pretty important venue for old school ECW fans. The main event of that show was ECW champion Big Show versus Batista. Two men who both epitomized the bigger is bigger model of sports entertainment and couldn't been more the antithesis of classic ECW if they'd come down to the ring carrying big signs that said careful now and down with this sort of thing. What happens next is ECW fans spending about 20 minutes bluntly informing WWE that their product is bad and they should feel bad with chants of boring, change the channel and a never-ending background chorus of boos that made it sound like the match was happening in a field of a thousand cows. Am I so out of touch? asks Vince. No. It's the ECW fans who are wrong. Number four, The Rock versus Mankind. Just a little bit of a heads up, pun definitely not intended. The rest of this list gets a bit serious from here on out. We've already mentioned earlier in the video that WWE had to come to terms with its own actions when it comes to the long lasting effects of concussions on its wrestlers. Frankly, in any concussion lawsuit against a big dub, you'd only ever need to provide this one bit of evidence, this match, because it's a f***ing snuff film. At the 1999 Rumble, Rock fought Mankind in an I Quit match, and throughout the course of the match, The Rock hits Mick Foley with 10 full-force steel chair shots to the head, including some from behind, which is the most f***ing dangerous kind of chair shot you can do. It's absolutely horrendous for a number of reasons. First, The Rock went off script with the number of shots, and Christ, how terrifying is that? Second, you can actually see Foley utterly out on his feet trying to protect himself, but he can't because he's handcuffed. He's in a dangerous environment and physically unable to protect himself. That is so scary. And third, because Foley's wife and kids were there in the crowd, in floods of tears. Just... Ugh. Number three, the 2004 Royal Rumble match. A good rumble that WWE have committed themselves to erasing from history, which is always super glaring because it's a rumble that's deeply entrenched in their rumble stats. Chris Benoit started the rumble at number one and won the whole thing, which is something that's only happened three times, WWE will tell you, when Shawn Michaels did it, when Edge did it, and what's the third time you ask? Haha, <laughs> says WWE. Royal Rumbles are just fun to watch. To be honest, you could just put all of Chris Benoit's matches on this list, the WrestleMania 20 main event, the SummerSlam 2004 main event, all stripped from WWE's guided tour of its own past for, let's be honest, completely understandable reasons, but trying to delete the Rumble 2004 from a format history that constantly celebrates its many winners over and over again, that is the biggest pain in WWE his ass, which again is a real shame because as a rumble, it's fairly brilliant. Number two, Jeff Jarrett and Deborah versus Val Venus and Nicole Bass. Oh man. So if we didn't tell you which event this match took place at, you'd be quite right to furrow your brow and say, I don't even slightly remember that match even taking place. It did. It took place at Over the Edge 1999. And this match has the very unfortunate distinction of being the first match to take place after the tragic accident that took Owen Hart's life. For those who don't know, Owen was supposed to be lowered to the ring in his blue blazer gimmick. The harness gave way and he fell to the ring below, sustaining injuries that cost him his life. WWE then made the completely wrong decision to continue on with the show. With this, tag team match. While that is terrible enough, it makes it much worse that WWE sent Owen's real-life friend, Jeff Jarrett, to the ring to wrestle right after the accident, including cutting a live backstage promo, which has since been removed from the network, along with any other footage of JR breaking the news of Owen's passing, where Jeff looks down the camera, white as a sheet, and says, Owen Hart, I'm praying for you, buddy, before then having to talk about Deborah's puppies. I, I wish I was f***ing 
and making that up. Jarrett was then sent through the curtain as Owen was wheeled past him on a stretcher and this entire match is a ghoulish example of WWE ignoring obvious trauma in the name of an attitude that has plagued wrestling throughout the years. The show has to go on. It really doesn't. And number one, Droz versus D'Lo Brown. I mean, yes, I that any anti-WWE rhetoric and the sensationalist title of this video to one side, this match will never be shown, should never be shown. Not WWE's fault, it's no one's fault. Sometimes terrible accidents happen. And on October 5th, 1999, a terrible accident happened when Droz wrestled D'Lo Brown for a SmackDown taping. D'Lo couldn't get purchased on Droz's shirt. A powerbomb was botched, which resulted in Droz being paralyzed. Darren Drozdov has regained some use of his arms and upper body in the 20 years since the accident. They've actually met up at wrestling events since, like one in 2018. But yeah, in amongst all the outrage and opinions and sarcasm and comment sections, this is a brutal industry where the wrong thing can happen at any given moment and you occasionally have to take a moment to put some power on that. The match itself was taped, will never air, with the only glimpse of it ever being broadcast being a shot in a Don't Try This At Home vignette showing officials lifting the stretcher with draws on it off the canvas, accompanied by the chilling words, careers ended in an instant. And that's our list. Uh, doesn't feel super appropriate to end with the up-tempo sales pitch we normally do, so take care everyone and we'll see you next time.